And look at that, my nephew gave me a free iPad. That's awesome. No, the you know, I know you're Indian, but Well, he is cuz, you know, my wife is. So So I want to talk today uh about fathers and and it's not my normal thing and I, and I just want to share that as if you're if you've been around a long time, you you kind of know that I don't really deviate from my preaching schedule just because of special days, all right? Except Christmas and Easter. And, uh, you know, so I don't preach about anything when it's Memorial Day or, you know, Fourth of July or any of that kind of stuff. It's just not... I just don't let the calendar determine my preaching schedule. But I'll tell you a little story. So every time I sit down to work on my sermon... God kept whispering in my ear, and it's, it was just a consistent thing. And, and two things happened, and all week I've sat down to work on my sermon, and two things would happen. And one would be God would say, talk about fathers. And the other thing that would happen is I'd be interrupted with something else, right? And, and so it took me a while to even get to it, because there were just a lot of uh, issues and needs this week. But... Uh, but every time, and, and once again, I sit down and the Lord said, uh, talk about fathers. And um, while you might think, well, that's logical because it's Father's Day, it's not, it's not logical in terms of how I approach things. And, and so obviously I'm going to listen because uh, I was sharing that with uh, Dave Brooks this morning that in, in the past four decades of preaching, um, I've never disobeyed the Lord about a sermon topic, right? And um, so it'd be bad to start. And, and I just couldn't escape this sense of pressing need from the Lord to talk about fathers today. And, 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 and uh, he kept quoting a piece of a scripture to me. And, and I don't often like it when people quote pieces of scripture, but I think God can do that because... He wrote it, right? And I don't think God quotes himself out of context. I don't think he manipulates scripture like a lot of people do, so it doesn't bother me. But he kept quoting this piece, and I'll read the scripture eventually, but the piece of scripture that he kept quoting to me is, um, you don't have many fathers. And every time he'd quote it to me, you don't have many fathers, he would, he would instill in my soul this importance of, of not just fathers, but the, this importance of the male role model in our culture, in, in our church, and in our family. And we're a fortunate church in that regard. I just want to say, we, in, in this body, we're fortunate that we have a really strong masculine context, and, and we have a, some really decent godly men that, um, that believe in the Lord and walk with Him, and, and we're grateful. And so I was thinking in the process of that about you know, you, you can't help but think about your own dad. And, and I will say, my, my dad was a pretty amazing fellow. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he fought in World War II in the Marines uh, for three and a half years in the jungles of Japan with a machine gun. And, uh, and he pastored and he worked and he labored and he raised us and he cared about each kid. And, and he just was, had a lot going for him. And he was a mechanical in, gen, in, genius guy mechanically. Uh, just his ingenuity uh, of problem solving was amazing. And, and he could fabricate just about anything out of metal. And, and he was quite a creator and he was innovative and, and uh, additionally had a very logical mind. Um, and and yet he served and he, he went and fixed things for people. And, and I learned to do all kinds of stuff just because he drug, drug me to every church that needed fixing, right? And any, any church that needed carpentry or electrical work or anything, he drug me there. And, and uh, I don't know whether to be grateful or resentful because ever since I've been fixing things, you know. But uh, that, and, and all those things contribute powerfully to how I feel about him but the one thing that stands out if you were to say well well why do you 
why do you, I mean, there are a lot of reasons I might have an attachment to my dad as anybody does to a parent. But if you were to say, what's, what's the real big reason that you feel this, this, this warmth of, of honor and value towards your father? And I would, I would blame my mother for that. That um, more than just my love and respect for him, what, what fashioned my, my admiration was with the way my mother spoke about him. That she went to great lengths to teach us how great a man she married. And she would talk to us about him being wise and kind and decent and and she taught her children to respect and revere their father now i i know her well enough and i know life well enough she didn't always feel that way personally but she never let her frustrations in the relationship affect how she guided her children and you'd say, well, you shouldn't you admire your mother for that? Well, absolutely. But do you understand that I value my father because of my mother's influence? And I think that's important. Uh, so I want to continue talking about fathers, and we'll connect it to different aspects of our walk with Christ, uh, of, of how we as a culture value men in generally, uh, yeah, and uh, just work through that. And so I'm going to start with 1 Corinthians 4.15. And I noticed some things in this. And you can say, well, this is about being a spiritual father. Well, we'll talk about that. And, and before you get too nervous, you know, we'll just, we'll just assume that I, I know a little bit about what I'm going to talk about and a little bit about the Bible, and we'll work through it. So be patient. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4.15 says this, You may have 10,000 teachers in Christ, but you don't have many fathers. Through the good news, I became your father in Christ Jesus. And uh, that's the statement. You don't have many fathers. What's the significance of the Lord making that statement? And I was using the, the ERV translation, if you're interested, because some of you are like, that doesn't seem like what he usually reads. I just chose the word order that I felt was closer to the original language and still in English. Um, and so, while there are many things from this verse that we can grasp, uh, there stands out in importance this idea of the Father in the life of people. And I want us to think in those terms that, uh, you know, and we could ask all those questions. It's always a little hard to talk, to say good things about men in America. Not because men in America are bad but because in general our culture has a bad attitude towards men. And, and you can deny it if you like, but then you could turn on the news if you like and, and see reality. And, and so I want to address some of those issues. And uh, so we could say, well, what about mothers? It's not Mother's Day. You had it. It's over. Forget it. Or as my wife will say, if I get a little bit... Uh, whiny or anything she just she's such a, a stinker but she'll just say get over yourself which I don't often repeat to her when she's whiny because I just don't feel the wisdom in that but um, in this verse what we see Paul doing is he intimates that there's something significant and formative about a father in other people's lives and you can say, well, yeah, but he's talking about spiritual fathers. But he's using natural fathers as an example of something valuable and credible in the lives of people. And, and uh, the first time I really, you know, I've read the scripture many times and thought about it. And, and, but the first, uh, the first time I really began to think about it was, uh, I, was in, I was in Africa. I was in Cameroon, which is 80% francophone and... Uh, you know, and so, and 20% Anglophone, so you're switching back and forth between French and English, and, and I was there, and, and they have a habit, they all called me daddy, 
uh, mostly because I'm just old, but uh, they would call me daddy, but not always. They didn't call every old guy that. And I, I'd gotten back from, from Africa, and I had a friend who had been a long-term missionary in a neighboring country to Cameroon, Nigeria, and we talked about some of that. And, and it was, there were some awkward times in Cameroon because... The, you know, sometimes there were there were like a what you'd call a chieftain society. So they were used to chiefs and villages, and and they had certain rules about, you know, cult in their culture not keeping their head higher than yours. And I remember this guy, this young man, six six, and he wanted to ask me a bunch of questions, and he's like this, Daddy, and he's because I'm five seven, so. I thought that it was odd. Then there's some things you can't really change or fix. But I, I came back and I was talking to my friend. I said, I, I don't understand, you know, just this attachment. And, and, he's, and he quoted that verse. He said, uh, you, in Scripture it says, you have not many fathers, though you have many teachers. And he said, the significance of what's happening there in their culture, and he'd lived there for years in, in, in nearby, and, and he said the significance is there's no shortage of people telling everyone what to think about Christ, but there's a shortage of men who model it and act like a father to them. And I, I, I think of that in our culture that, that we live in, in, our, in our nation here in the United States, we live in a culture that has no shortage of opinion. No shortage of books, no shortage of anything that, that people are just saying, well, this is true and that's true. There's no shortage of people who talk about who Jesus is. But we do have a shortage of people we can truly view as fathers. And somewhere in the kingdom, God believes that's important. And, and, and that's the issue. That when we think of ourselves, you know, how many believe, so you, you can raise your hand on this one, it's not a trick or anything. How many truly believe that it's important to be a follower of God? How many believe if you go any other direction, you're no longer following him? You know, fewer people believe that than believe that you should be a follower of God. I just wanted to note that fewer hands went up. I don't know if it's significant, but it's interesting. And I'm telling you, who, all of you who want to believe that, father, that, that, that we're followers of God and that, that if you're not following God, you're, you're, if you're going in a different direction, you're no longer following God. I'm telling you, God believes in the importance of fathers this morning. And if you feel anything in you that rises up against that statement, that is between you and our Heavenly Father. And if you can't receive that reality, it's a spiritual, it's a spiritual hardness in you that will not assimilate to God's point of view. And I think that addresses the struggle in our culture in postmodern America. And, and we see examples of how God feels about fathers, right? Who did Jesus pray to? God the Father. And, and I know, I know, there's a move to change some of those things to non gender discriminate terms and all that, which is foolishness. It's foolishness. In fact, it's just an interesting side note uh, in, terms of, in terms of language. I doubt anyone's really going to appreciate it. You know, maybe this weirdo nerd nephew of mine that knows Greek. But um, in, in, in the Greek language, the word for spirit, pneuma, is actually what we call a neuter term. It's non-discriminate. And so the proper pronoun for it would normally be it. Okay. 
But in, in John chapters 14 through 16, when Jesus is speaking of the Spirit, and he uses the word pneuma, and then he says, when he comes. And Jesus violates Greek grammar to make a point. Now, I don't think Jesus was ignorant of Koine Greek. How many of you think he knows that language? It's a dead language, but he knows it. It's not as dead as Latin, but he knows it. And uh, yet, he violated grammar to make a point about the Holy Spirit. And people in our, in our nation, in their ignorance, would think that those concepts are interchangeable when God doesn't believe that. And we, we understand that fathers provide an unseen stability that leaves a hole when they're not there. And you never quite know how much until they're not there. And, and I, I could think of different examples. Um, over the years, you know, four decades, I've been dealing with people. And uh, what I've noticed, how many families are disrupted in, in tremendous ways when dad passes, when he's gone. That the unity, it doesn't even seem to have the same strength or connection. And, and you say, well, how does that happen? It's something that God designed that we can't change. And, and I know of myself, uh, you know, there was a time I, uh, I was a line driver. And, and what that means, I was driving all over the U.S. and Canada. And, and just back and forth. And, and uh, just never home, just driving. And there was a lot of time Debbie was with me. But, uh, you know, the last year or so, I was... I was on my own and she was home and with Ashley and Ashley was in school and I would be gone three months at a time and come home and, and it was like that. And, and uh, I, remember, uh, I remember one time I came home and I thought, you know, I just, I just like to go hunting. That was before I couldn't eat meat, right? And, and so I, I just thought, I'd like to go hunting. I, and, and I got home and it was hunting season. Now, I'd been gone for three months, got home, it's hunting season, and uh, I could see, as I'm getting, I'm leaving at early in the morning, but I could see, you know, that Debbie and Ashley, they were frustrated, and I left. I went out, and I got out in the woods, and I was absolutely miserable. Just because there were no deer, no, I'm kidding, I was miserable, and and, and I realized about 10 o'clock in the morning, I wasn't having fun. I wasn't enjoying myself. I wasn't glad to be out there. And I went home and fell asleep in the living room in a chair. And there was peace in the hearts of my family. And it had nothing to do with my actions and everything to do with my presence. And, and I, part of it, one of the reasons, one time I, I figured out a way to get home right away. I'd been gone a long time. And uh, this is a story where some of you, you know, sensitive people go, oh, you know, uh, don't do that. I don't like it. But anyhow, I don't care. And, and I was gone. I was over the road and, and Debbie called me. And, and at that time, you know, no cell phones. So it's like once a week or something we'd talk and. She said, I lost Ashley. I couldn't find Ashley anywhere. Didn't know where she was. Looked everywhere for her. And I said, well, did, obviously you found her. She was in the bathroom smelling your cologne and crying. So I came home. The fragrance of a father represents his presence in the life of his children. And that's true naturally and it's true spiritually. And it matters. And, and I, I'm talking about these things because in our nation we have a corrupted value 
when it comes to family. That God wants to heal and restore, but a better word is rectify. If God believes it matters, it must matter. We live in a culture that has grown to minimize the importance of the father image. And, and it's just one of those things. It, you, you, you look around and you're going to see evidence that it, we live in a culture that has minimized the importance of the father image. And you say, well, are, you're partial to the idea because you're a dad, which is, you know, I guess if you're a dad, you're going to have a certain bias there. But just so you know, I'm partial to mothers too. We wouldn't be here without a father or a mother. I'm particularly partial to my wife. That's why we've been married for 43 years. Um, and, and it's not about that. It's what does God think and what is he witnessing and what do we see? And, and we as a culture, you know, if you just think of TV shows and you take, you know, uh, the, the old TV show, the title's a great show, right? Father Knows Best. It, we've gone from that to idiot. What an idiot. It isn't easy for the men in our church to be dads in a culture that hates men. It's not easy. In fact, it's not even easy sometimes. I've gone to places as a, as a professional pastor. It's not even easy being a male pastor sometimes because you'll be in a room and, and there could be 34% of the room could be females and someone will say, I can see we need more women here. And it's not your fault. You didn't decide you would be born male. That was a decision of God. I was in a conference and some statistics were thrown up and, and, and they said in the 90s, the average age of our pastors was, was 30-something years old and now it's 60-something years old and I'm like, I'm the same guy in the same church. And we have all those statistics about men too and, and, and it's unhealthy to give in to a culture that despises creation as God designed it. And, and I could speak positively about mothers in, in any situation, anywhere on the planet, and everybody would, would be thrilled. And if you say too many positive things about men, there will be people who are offended that you're doing so. And a woman can say, I was, I'm glad to be a woman. But if a man says it, he's misogynistic. Which is a fancy word to say he hates women. And most of you know, you've heard the word. How many have heard that word before, misogynistic? You're familiar with it. Um, does anyone know the word for someone who hates men? Never heard that word in our culture, have you? Did you know there is one? It's called misandry. It's the severe hatred of men. And, and just as a, as a man could be misogynistic, a woman could be misandristic. But we don't even know such a word exists in a culture like ours. And, and, and even in this moment... There could be people thinking, don't you think you're making some women uncomfortable and no one ever wonders if they're ever making men uncomfortable in our culture. And you say, well, Charles, you sound like you're frustrated. I'm not frustrated on my behalf because I'm a recluse. It doesn't matter. I'm frustrated on behalf of the men in this body whose importance can be minimized by a culture that doesn't want to see things as God sees them. As we edge out the male role model, we suffer as a culture. And, and, and uh, I mean, some of you are in an age bracket, you can witness that what has changed in our culture. 
and you can witness what is happening to upcoming generations because we have edged out the value of a male role model. Now, do you think this is an appropriate discussion on Father's Day? The answer is yes. Have you ever considered what it's like for a man who's exceptionally capable in his field and his career, one having true expertise, earning a living to come home and be treated like a simpleton? To have things explained to them as though he's an idiot when he makes powerfully important decisions every day of his life. And that's where I honor my mother. She honored my father. Don't, and, and so even in our culture, even men in great authority are treated as nothing in our culture because of their gender. I would say don't let this develop in your home or your heart. And we see then there's a pattern in scripture, there's a pattern of fatherhood established for us when Jesus prays in the Garden of Gethsemane. Right? And, and I, I want to preface what I'm going to explain with the, the fact that a lot of people who really don't know anything have said a lot of things about this phrase, Abba, Father. And every time they open their mouth, they illustrate that they know nothing. So that's what I think. That frustrates me. In fact, I, I was reading, we were, I read something a while back, a couple years ago, Debbie said, what do you think of that? And handed it to me. And I said, uh, well, what, what has clearly been proven is this individual writing this doesn't know Greek or Hebrew. Even though they say they looked it up. Because we live in a culture, on, additionally, that loves the easy button. Right? If it's not easy, we don't figure it out. And maybe that's one of the symptoms of suppressing the value of the father role. And so we, we have this experience, and I'm going to read it. Mark 14.36 is a great one to read, where Jesus, he goes in the garden, he has his disciples sit over there, and, and he, he begins to pray to the father. And he uses this phrase, and, and I'm going to read it from English and then tell you that they didn't finish translating it. Uh, but in Mark 14, 36, he said, Abba, Father, you can do anything. Take this cup of suffering away from me, but let your will be done rather than mine. And we're familiar with that prayer. And, oh, Abba, Father. I, what, what you find in that verse is two problems. They translated the Greek word and they transliterated the Hebrew word. And transliterate means they took a Hebrew word and spelled it in English. And translate means they put the English word in translative place of the Greek word. And so literally what Jesus says in the garden here in two different languages is father, father. And very literally father, the father. And, and the word Abba is the Hebrew word for father. And the word pater in Greek is the word for father. Why did he do that? And, and first of all, you know, if you, you say, well, I'll just Google that or whatever your search engine is. I'll just, and or I'll ask Siri. And Siri only knows what Siri knows and it's very limited. But um, if you do that, you'll get all the wrong answers. And they'll usually just say, Abba is a term of intimacy. Well, it is, only because the relationship of a Hebrew father to his children is an intimate experience. It isn't the term, it isn't the word that draws you near. It's the relationship. 
And in our culture, we've heard people come up with sayings like Daddy God and Papa and all these things to describe our Father in heaven. And all they're managing to do is disrespect the one that they should have a relationship with. And that intimacy doesn't come through familiarity of terms, but through submission of heart and true obedient relationship to the Father. So you have to really to understand what Jesus is doing here when he says Abba is the father. He's actually Abba HaPater. And and if you want that phrase, that's the phrase really. And he said, and he said Abba Father. It's Kai Elegan Abba HaPater in the Greek. And what he's saying there is this Hebrew version of what a father is, is what the father is. And, and in the Hebrew culture, and there's a very distinct, there, there's a stark difference between um, an Abba and a Pater, if I were to use the Greek and Hebrew terms. That, that a Hebrew dad was very uh, in tune in relationship with his children. And when they're old enough to work with him, they worked with him. And he discipled them. And he, he inter- interacted with them. And he taught them. And, and if they were a son, he would, every day, his son was with him constantly. And he raised him up and discipled that child. And that's, that's the Abba. And when, first of all, we learn that's, a, that's who God is. That God is very in tune with us. How many believe that? Oh, I'm glad it was more than four. And the, but the Greek father, the Greek dad, the pater, he didn't do that. In the Greek culture of ancient times, the dad made the money. He was the one seen in the city. He d- dealt with the business. And mom stayed home and discipled the children or raised them and mentored them and modeled for them. And, and in fact, it was an interesting experience. Uh, well, we saw the, the situation in both ancient Greece and Philippi, but at this particular time, we were in the ancient ruins of Corinth. And, um, and we came to a place that was a public restroom, right? And you say, well, how do you know? Duh. Right? It, it, because they had a stone slab with little keyhole slots cut out. You know what those are, right? Those were the toilet seats. And uh, there's some other things you don't want to know about that. But, uh, you know, what you did if you were a man of means is your slave went in and warmed it up for you and stuff like that because it was made of stone. And, uh, but uh, that, that was one of the things. This was a public restroom. Oh, and pretty soon one of the individuals said, well, where's the women's? Was this a men's or women's restroom? Well, it was a men's restroom. Well, where's the women's restroom? And the answer is this. A decent woman of antiquities would not have been seen in public in the city. They were removed. They were at home. And, and what we learn is dad wasn't at home. He was out making money and he showed up periodically, but he wasn't a true Abba. He was a disengaged, removed father. And and first thing, what we see in the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane is that the Lord is showing us that God isn't, he's not a distant dad that's uninvolved. He's involved with us. It matters. There's this this issue of of intimacy through relationship that occurs. And, And the other thing we learn is that's not who we're supposed to be. But there's another aspect of being Abba that the Lord reveals in his prayer. And that in the Hebrew culture, the Abba was very revered and honored and respected. In the same way I talked about my mother teaching us the importance of our dad in our lives. And and going to great lengths to teach us to value him and respect him. That's what happened in the Hebrew home. And, and in the same way, that's what's supposed to be happening in our relationship with the Lord. And you say, well, well, how do you know that? You know, not my will, but your will be done. It's in the book. 
And, and I don't think anyone lacks knowledge of scriptures that teach the importance of honoring and respecting husbands in the home. They just don't like to talk about them, but they know they're there. And so we see Jesus establishing this pattern and, and, and that we can't turn it into an Americanized version of Abba. Any more than as Christians can we truly Americanize God's expectations on his people. Can we really say this is how it should be because this is how we want it to be. As men, we must not abdicate our leadership roles in our children's lives. That's, what, that's one of the lessons we learned. That, that uh, you know, one thing I knew about my dad, I was close with him, even in, along into adulthood. But I would have never thought of him as a buddy because I valued him too much for that. And as men, we cannot abdicate our leadership roles in our children's lives. We are there to set godly examples and influence our children to godly adulthood. And that's our calling as men who have children. And even men who don't have children, there are people around us that need that influence from us. And my dad didn't have that. That's an interesting point. He had a strong dad who died when he was 12 and never really well he came to the lord i told that one fred adams he uh, he died on the hospital and came back and my grandmother said i thought i lost you and he said my heart's too wicked i had to do something first gave his heart to the lord and died again that is cutting it too close but that's the man that raised my dad and my dad didn't really understand a lot about being a dad and, he, and, and so when he was 12 you know it was a long time ago he got a hardship license and he had to take care of his mom and, and it went on like that and, and uh, for a long time you wonder how did he learn to be such a good example of fatherhood and his answer was I just do for you what God has done for me. That the Father in heaven was his example. And the Father in heaven is your example. And, uh, As we think about this process uh, of being godly examples, there's a scripture in 1 Timothy 2.8, and it says this, um, Therefore I desire that men to pray in every place, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And I, that's interesting. I desire that men everywhere pray and lift up holy hands without wrath or doubting. And... This is the hard thing for people in our day and age to comprehend. This is a very gender-specific verse written to male human followers of Christ. You say, well, well, don't leave the women out. There are scriptures that are specific for you too. Get over yourself. Quoting my wife, you know. It's cute when she says it. It's probably not when I do it. Um, and, and we know it's a gender because the next verse is very gender specific to women verse 9 just so you know um, I, I want women to show their beauty by dressing appropriate clothes that are modest and respectable their beauty will be shown by what they do not by hairstyles and jewelry and pearls and expensive clothes I don't think there's anything wrong with hairstyles jewelry or, or expensive clothes as long as it's someone else's wife but uh because yeah, it's money. Uh, no, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But what you do and who you are is really your true beauty. Who Jesus is living out in you 
It really is an amazing beauty in the women of this church. Don't get sucked into the wrong stuff. But that I really only quote, read that scripture to point out that there's this verse about men praying and lifting holy hands that is specific to men. That it's a calling on men to lift up hands and pray. And, and we don't often like to think that, well, they're, they're gender-specific scriptures, but there are. Here's, I'm going to read one that, that is fun because uh, it irritates everyone just about. That's probably why I like it. Um, but uh, here's a verse that is praises manly character. On Father's Day, we should be able to read verses that praise manly character. Um, I, I just, f f something flashed through my mind, you know, memories, and, and that was one of the things I think my mom would would tell us. She praised my dad's manly character in terms of his courage and his diligence and, and his work ethic. And she would have this phrase, some of you will recognize it, you old folks. Um, she'd say, he's a man's man. And she meant he's the kind of man that men respect. Not a girly man. A man's man. And she'd say stuff like that. And it was okay. So listen to the scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I'm going to read verse 13. Uh, I don't know why it has two verse 13s. Oh, I do. I'm going to read a modern translation that translates out the gender-specific character trait, and then I'm going to read one that leaves it in. And then I'm going to talk about the Greek text. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 says, Be alert, be firm in the Christian faith, be courageous and strong. Right? You say, well, that, that can apply to everyone. Let's read uh, a more literal translation in English. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be like a man, and be strong. And it uses this word, andridzomai, in the Greek text, that literally means act manly. You, the Bible says, act manly. There's nothing wrong with it. That that is an example of strength. Have you noticed that the more our culture has diminished the value of men, the more middle-aged boys we have? And I'm being kind when I say middle-aged. That could go clear up to 50 and none of them are going to make it to 100. Because life's hard on stupid people. You should stop undervaluing men. Whether you're a man or woman, that's irrelevant. You should stop undervaluing them. And, and in, the, in the American church, we have turned feminine traits into spiritual traits and, and male traits into sinful traits, and that's not at all true. And, and if we just use, and I'm not bashing women, I'm just saying I don't think that's true. And, and if we use as an example, you know, men use about 2,000 words a day and women use about 6,000 words a day. Roughly, and it, it varies depending on the individual. And, and so when you hear women pray, they often sound more spiritual because they use more words. And men grunt, men grunt in groanings that cannot be uttered, you know. It's like, oh, Jesus, help, you know, stuff like that. That's what I do. And it, it's no less spiritual. The longest recorded prayer of Jesus in the Bible is John 17. It's two minutes long. The most famous prayer of Jesus in the Bible is 29 seconds long. We call it the Lord's Prayer. And I believe 
that the devil has a plan in this, and I'm not trying to demonize anything, but I think the devil has a plan in devaluing the male role model in our culture. The less we value fathers, the less we understand our relationship to God the Father. And, and I understand, you know, I've been at this a long time. I know there are people that didn't have a good father. I get it. But you do now. And, and if you're old, you know, I've always felt, if you're old enough to know that you didn't have a good father or mother or whatever, you're old enough to get past it. And know the difference. And, and this is what Jesus, one of the things Jesus was showing us in the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, that the Father is an Abba, involved and respected. Let your will be done. That he's not a Bubba in the sky or Papa or Daddy or anything like that. He's our heavenly father, and he's to be valued and respected and earnestly sought after. Because the stability of the family of God is linked to the father God in heaven. And we see that a couple of scriptures that, re, that represent that. Romans 8, 15. You haven't received the spirit of slaves that leads you into fear again. Instead, you have received the spirit of God, adopted children, by which we call out, Abba, Father. Galatians 4, 6. Because you are God's children, God has sent the spirit of his son into us to call out, Abba, Father. When we recognize the reverent, value of the Father in heaven, it's because the Spirit of Christ is doing that work in us. And if we rebel against that work, we are rebelling against the Spirit of Christ. Without a godly father role in the home, what happens? And so that puts responsibility on the shoulders of dad. I get that. Without a godly father image in the home where dad has some authority, kids can't grow up fully comprehending a sovereign role of God in their life. And, and you know what? It's an empirically sound psychological observation. That children that don't grow up with, the, with that sense of the sovereign, godly influence of a dad in their life struggle with their obedience before the Father in heaven. That doesn't doom everyone who has a bad father image. But it's something that's present and happens and takes place. Why make it harder for our children? And, and, and I know for myself, I easily moved into an understanding that God was in charge. It was easy for me. Because I grew up in a home where my dad has, was respected by my mother. And based on my mother's respect for my dad, I understood how to respect the Lord God in heaven. It was modeled for me by my mother. I learned to honor my earthly father and it was easy to honor my heavenly father. So I'm going to tell a little story about that. It just might surprise you that I'm opinionated. And sometimes my mind works pretty fast and, and uh, I was in the throes of something. I was in high school, I was in the throes of something with my dad and I said something. And my dad didn't say a word. Kind of like Moses, not sticking up for himself didn't say anything my mom got right in my face like she could do anything right she got right in my face and said you have forgotten who that man is you're speaking to him and you don't realize that he's your father and you owe him everything especially your respect now those are the words of a godly mother.
It doesn't take much ability to see that we have stepped too far away from God's original plan in our culture, does it? What's difficult to see is our individual parts in it. We can look around us and say, oh yeah, we're going the wrong direction, but we can't see that we are part of the problem. That we as individuals have contributed to this demise. Our, pl our pride blinds us to it. And because, it, as it says in Scripture, a person will not fail to declare their own righteousness. We're so busy declaring our own righteousness that we can't repent. Men give up and give in too easily. Women often don't want to honor that position in the home. These things take place in our culture. This is not a battle of the sexes for power. This is a battle against what God would do for our future generations. That when we dismiss God's plan for the family, we are causing our own posterity to pass through the fires of this world unnecessarily. And what we learn is that we all need more humility. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we are grateful for godly men. And yet we also need to be grateful for those same men before they were godly. That some of the men we might admire the most were ungodly men once upon a time. And so we must be grateful for all that you will do in the lives of our families. My prayer this morning is that we will honor you by honoring your belief in dads this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Lord bless you. Would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me.